guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. I was praying and, and I was asking God, okay, so what should I speak about? And, um, and I debated um, myself because God already tells you what he wants you to speak on, right? But I'm like, That's, I don't like that topic. You know, he gives you a topic, and you're like, Lord, why can you give this topic to my husband, you know? You just give me the other topics. But um, the title of my message is Keys, and and you'll find out soon why. But I want to pray because I believe that today, tonight, did you see? I just made a word. Tonight and today, 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 I said. Like to mañana, tomorrow and mañana. So learning already, write it down. It could be in the Urban Dictionary. But I want to pray because I believe that God has a word, not just for you, but for me. I believe that this is a timely word. I believe that this is the year that we, uh, it's spoken. This is a, a new rebirth for the, for the church. This is the time when God is if choosing his, his, his children to do great exploits for, for the kingdom. But I also believe that the enemy doesn't want us to do that. The enemy is so against his reckless love. Like when I sing it, I'm in tears. I don't know if I still have makeup, but it's like he is, God, how can you be so reckless? And we're so guarded, right? We're so guarded in how we love people and, and, and who we allow it in our lives. We're very, you know, we're in church, but we're like little kitties, you know, like don't touch me. And, um, but I believe that this word, it comes from the throne room of God. I believe that it's going to bring freedom to your life. I believe that it's going to bring deliverance to your life. That it's going to bring healing to your life. As a matter of fact, he says that he's going to deliver some of you tonight that are sitting right here because you have been wanting to, um, well, I'm going to pray because I'm going to, when you bow your heads and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you give me the opportunity to speak the goodness. The goodness that only comes from you, Father. And I ask tonight, Father God, that every person that's here, and every person that represents a family, Father God, I thank you that you, o- you will open their eyes to see beyond, beyond their moment, beyond their pain. That you will open their hearts to receive the word, Father God, the word that transforms lives, Father. And that we reconcile tonight who we are in you and who you are in our lives, Father God. Just like we sang, Father God, and those are not empty songs. Those are words of life. We're speaking your word when we sing that your promises are yes and amen. But I know, Father God, that you said that there's many people here, sitting here, you don't have to raise your hand, but I believe that there's many people here that you have desire, you have been asking God because you've been stuck in a place, you have asked God, like, take me, Lord. I'm not good. I'm broken. I'm I'm, I'm not, I can't do anything anymore. You won't, you won't hear me. Nothing is changing. And you feel like you're done. You have suicidal thoughts. And the Lord says, I am with you. The Lord says, I have never left you. Do you understand? I do. I am. I am that good that I'm so reckless pursuing you. You have never been alone. Every tear that you have shed, God has carried it with him. And I want you to know that tonight as a message is going forth, if that is you, I declare freedom in your mind. I declare deliverance in your mind. I declare that no matter what we face, we know who we are. And we know who is backing us up. And that is you, Jesus. So I thank you, Father. I thank you that this is a message of encouragement. That we will know. That we will know that we know how good you are. And you are always good, Father God. And that we do not allow doubt. We do not allow unbelief. We do not allow the lies of the enemy, Father God, to be louder than your voice. So I thank you, Father God, for your mercy. I thank you, Father God, that yes, we don't deserve it, and yet you love us so much. We don't deserve your promises, and yet you want to bless us, Father God. So I thank you that anyone here that is sick in body, Father God, they will receive their healing. Anyone here that is bound, Father God, in addiction is free tonight, Father God. Anyone here who has been desired, Father God, to commit suicide, I I command, Father God, that foul spirit, that lying spirit to go in Jesus' name. 
because you matter. You matter more than you think. You matter to the kingdom of God. God needs you, and you were born for such a time as this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to start good, right? That's, a good, that's, that's good news. Um, I believe that God, um, I want you to go to John 3.16 because I, I don't want you, um, you know, I, I, this, wow, I'm, a, I'm about to be 22 years old in Jesus, right? In Jesus because I gave my life to Christ <clears throat> December 1996. But I believe that throughout my journey with God, there have been times when the enemy, when things get really rough, you know, the enemy, I want you to know that the enemy, you need to know that we do have an enemy and no, it's not your spouse, it's not your friend, it's not your family. The enemy that we have, his name is the devil, his name is Satan. And I'm going to tell you that he's a liar. Nothing that comes out of his mouth, not even one suggestion that, she, he, that he has about your life is true. Not even one. He has not even an ounce of truth in him. That's not his nature. The nature of the enemy is that he is a liar and the father of all lies. And he's cunning and he's dirty. And he does his homework and he studies us. But I'm going to tell you that we have someone who loves us so much. John 3.16. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him. Do you believe in the son of God? Do you believe in Jesus? So it says, for whoever believes in, the, in, in, the, in him should not, should not perish but have everlast, everlasting life. And sometimes we stop there, right? We quote John 3.16. A lot of people have tattoos, John 3.16. I think they should go for John 3.17. Because I love what it says. It says, 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Do you know that God is not condemning you right now? Do you know that every, the moment we are born, this, that's the moment that already God prepared a plan to, for us to be reconciled to him? And he's going to do whatever it takes to pursue you. And he so loves us that he's never, we think that he's condemning us. We think that he's judging us. Have you ever, have you ever had a moment with God or you've done something, you said something that you should have never said or you did something that you should have never done. And then you're sitting and, and then you're thinking that God has stopped the plan for your life. And you're thinking there is no way that God still feels the same way about me. Because I know what I said, I know what I did, I, I know my thoughts, and I know that he reads my thoughts, right? But do you know that he's not, when we're alive, all he's doing is pursuing you so you can live out your purpose on this earth. Do you know that we are the one who judge him? He's not judging us. We judge him unfaithful. Many times I have judged him unfaithful. You're going to say, my gosh, how can you do that, Pastor? Yeah, when I think he's not going to come through, I judge him unfaithful. When I think that he's not going to heal me or, or, or I come in prayer and, and I feel that, you know what, he, did, he didn't hear me. He's not hearing me. I don't know what else I have to do, but he's not here with me. I'm going to tell you that's the moment I am judging him unfaithful. And yet he knows. He knows everything about you. I don't know if you're a mistake. You know, many times we deal with so many things because the way we were brought up and you're like, was I a mistake? You know what? That there is no mistakes in God. Maybe your parents told you, you know, you were not planned. You know, they just love to tell you that. I don't think they should tell us that, you know. It's funny that I wasn't planned, but you planned for other things, right? I didn't plan for you. I mean, I don't know if it's just Hispanics, but they love to tell you that. You were an accident. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting you. Oh, great. Do you know that, does, that it does something to a person to, when you hear it? Oh, really? One seed. One seed. We didn't even want to have any more children. A year you get, there, you, you came up. We didn't want girls. We just wanted boys. And yeah, there you are. And you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because maybe that wasn't in their plans, but it was in the plan of God. So you're not an accident. We, right now, everybody's so confused with gender. I'm going to tell you that God does not make accidents. 
God is not that cruel. They will be, put you in a body of a, of a male and then yet, yet you thought that you were born that way. No, God does not make mistakes. And I'm going to tell you that God is able to be there with you. He's able to deal with your issue. We're afraid to talk about those things, right? That's for the world to decide. No, let me tell you, if you go back to the word of God, no, God doesn't make mistakes. He actually knew me before the foundation of the earth. Do you know that he knew you before the foundation of the earth? Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctify you. I ordain you as a prophet to the nations. Do you know that before you, even your parents consider you, if you were planned awesome, and if you were not planned awesome, because it says, even before I found the earth, even before I thought about creating earth, I thought about you. And I actually not only thought about you, I gave you a plan, I ordained you, I sanctify you. Do you understand that we are sanctified by the blood of Jesus? You and I are sanctified by the blood of Jesus. And he is that good. So the enemy doesn't want you to think that you're good. You know what? We represent a king. We represent Jesus on this earth and he wants us to represent him well. But it's hard to represent him well when I don't even believe that he loves me. And I'm talking to Christians. If you're here on a Wednesday because you're hungry. Right? Other people, my guy was raining. Oh, dear Jesus. You know, the hair, the hair. Believe me. I thought about the hair too. But I was like, I have to be in church. Even if I preach with my, all my frees here, right? I was well covered, but you know. But God so loves that he was willing to pay for all of our sins. You know, I was having a conversation not too long with the Lord. Um, you know, when you have those conversations with God, like, um, and you're just being frank, right? Because I don't know why we pretend, right? We come in prayers. Sometimes we say, I don't know how to pray. Praying is a conversation. Praying is just a reminder. We remind God of his word, right? But it's a conversation. When I go to my dad's house, I don't go. I, when I go to my dad's house, I still go. I don't ask permission to, to lay down on their bed. I actually say, why are you guys going to feed me? Dad, go get me pupusas, and he does everything for me. You know, like, I go to my dad's house. I don't sit there and say, you know, Dear Father, that you birthed me. <laughs> Boy, you had a part in the birthing. You had the fun part. My mom had the other one. I want to talk to you, Father. And I, I, who talks like that? Right? No, we, we, we talk, right? We talk. And that's, that's what God wants you to talk, you, you know. He knows everything. But we go pretending. It's time to go to the throne room, okay, and stop pretending. You tell him everything. Do you know that he loves it? He loves it when you go to him. If you're going to complain, complain to him. So I was having a conversation with him. And, and um. And I was just looking at my life, you know, my beautiful 30-something years. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not. <clears throat> but I was looking at my life, and I was like, oh. And as I was able to see my life, like, in my timeline, I'm like, God, you've always been with me. You've always been with me. But my conversation wasn't because I was happy. I was just, I came with complaints, right, to him. How dare you? You let it, you let the A, B, C, D, and we went to Z. And you know that he just sat there and he just listened. I, 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 I can picture him just having a conversation. And then I told him at the end, and I don't even know why you chose me. Because I'm not doing good. I'm mad at you right now. Can we talk real? I'm mad at you right now. Talk to the hand. <laughs> Disrespectful. Because I was so mad. You know, when you're in pain, you're like, come, things come out of your mouth. 
And then he said to me, Virginia, do you think that I die for you for your best day? We think that he died for us or he gave us an office of a pastor or he gave you your, your calling or your purpose because of your best day. He said, no matter what, good. If you're good, it will never be good enough. You will never be good enough. I chose you at your worst. I chose you when you were going to tell me this. I know what you were going to say because I am your alpha and I'm your omega. I know. He knows every thought. We can't pretend, but he knows every thought. And yet knowing whatever you've done, I don't know your past, whatever you've done, whatever you're doing, even if you're a Christian tonight and you still one, one, one foot in the world and one, and, one, and one in the church, or one in his word, I'm going to tell you that he knows every step. And yet he would choose you all over again. And I started to cry. I mean, I was like, and I went to my gosh, remember when I told you this? I purchased you. I paid for that already. He paid for every sin. Do you understand? That's why I think it's so hard for us to grasp because we are so conditional. We're so conditional. We, we have contracts with people. And it has loops. And he has those little, you know, have you seen those little when they want to loop you in the contracts? And then it, the, the, the letter is like half of a font and you're like, you know, not even with, you can't even read it. But I'm going to tell you that God wants you to know that he loves you. This is for somebody here that he knows what you have been doing. You actually did it today. And he says, and yet I chose you and I knew about that. And all I want you is to reconcile yourself with me, to know that I accept you, I forgive you. And do you know that the moment we repent, that's the moment we're in right standing with God? Do you know that Jesus, he doesn't, he's not in heaven on a, he doesn't have a board or like, have you watched the movie, um, it's a Christmas movie, about the train, uh, the Polar Express? You know how Santa is like, why you've been doing good for the whole year and all these little movies are playing and he's keeping tally i'm gonna tell you that jesus doesn't keep tally of our sins god doesn't keep a record of our wrongs and that's the kind of love that you and i need to live abiding in the love it's so we can, we're able to give that love back he loves you. I don't know for who, but I'm, I'm going to say he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And I know that he's been speaking to so many of us, but we have refused to listen because we don't like it. You know, everything has a process. And to me this year, the more things have been taking place in my life, I mean, if I tell you, I mean, I broke my toe. But praise Jesus is whole and healed. You see, I'm like, Lord, I need to wear my high heels. There is no way I can preach on Wednesdays and I look like this. Right? Then the flu turned into pneumonia. Well, then because I was forced to be in bed, then my, my toe healed. I was like, wow, Lord, you know, you're, you're using everything, you know. You use everything for my, for, for my good. And you know what? I have to see it that way because if not, I'm going to be like, oh, my gosh, the enemy is attacking me. He is on the, he's on the prowl. No, you know what? No, God is going to turn around everything that the devil meant for. He was going to turn around for my good. And that's what you have to say. He said, I want my children to walk in my freedom. I want my children to walk in such deliverance that they know who they are. You know when you know who you are, no one can tell you. No one can tell you otherwise. And that's why we have so many people confused because this is the thing, this is what the world says you are because I have mannerisms or whatever. I am this person, I am this gender. No, 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 no. You are who you are. If you were, if God already uh, predestined you, he ordained you, he sanctified you, he knows who you are, you need to know who you are. If not, the devil, will conf the devil will confuse you. He wants to confuse us. 
He wants us to be effective, but not as, an, as, as effective. Because if I don't know who I am, I want to be able to get to a place that, hey, hits can come, but you know what? I'm still standing. And hits will come into your life. We're talking about, you know, building, right? Building the house of God. I build my house. Do you know that you are his house? And you know that you have places in your life that you have not given God access. There's rooms in your life that you know what? No, Lord. I'm going to give you the living room because that one is always clean, right? In case people <laughs> visit you. I'll give you the bathroom downstairs for the guests because that's clean. No one's allowed it upstairs because no one upstairs doesn't know how I have the house, right? All the drawers at the bottom, they're all in place. But you go to the second floor and it's like, oh, dang. Right? God wants access. You are, you are his house. He dwells in us. He dwells in me. And he's so faithful and so merciful that he will show you the rooms at, at, the, at the proper time when you need to deal with those rooms. Because sometimes we have rooms that, you know what, I didn't put that there. Someone went in, you know, if we had, we're in a family, right? All of a sudden, you know, you, the closet is not the closet. Now it's, it has become a storage unit. There's things that I didn't put there. My kids did it. I asked them to clean the room and they put it in the closet. Know that they do that because they don't do that. Yeah, right. But, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm the one who does it. My God, I need to clean. Right? But I believe that God is asking you, I, I want you to allow me to go in in some places of your life, and I don't want you to be afraid of pain. And he wants you to know that you always, always, as long as we are breathing and living on this earth, we're always going to have an accuser. And he's always going to come and accuse us because he knows our patterns. This is what I wrote. God loves you, and you're not alone. As I say, he's your alpha and your omega. He's your author and finisher of your faith. No one gets to, do not give the enemy privilege to write in your story. He's the author and finisher of my faith. Hey, Satan, all he does is accuse. That's his job. And I want us to go to Zechariah. Zechariah 3, 1 and 3. Oh my God, time's flying. Are you there, Diane? This is Zechariah. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest. This is Zechariah, and he's seen in the spirit. And he says, he showed me the high priest. The high priest, you know what? The high priest in those times were the most holy people of all. Standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand side to accuse him. You know, that was before Jesus died on the cross, because now who's at the right hand of the Father? Who comes? It's Jesus. And he's standing at the right hand. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He is interceding for you and I. We have an advocate. No one now, now before the enemy could accuse us, but now no one, no one. Do you understand the enemy has no, no right to accuse us? Because we have Jesus with us. And he's standing at the right side to accuse. And then the Lord said to Satan, this is the Lord. He says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. He actually was screaming because he has that, like, what do you call it? Bing, whatever. The Lord rebuke you. He, he, he screamed. Oh, I wish he was in caps. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? You know what he meant to say when he said that? You know, is it, yeah, I know all his filthiness. I snatched him when he was dirty. I did it. So you can't accuse him. You can't accuse him. Oh, but you don't know, God, he's a user. Oh, no, I know, I snatched him from it. Oh, but he's an alcoholic. I snatched him from it. But she's a liar. You know, I snatched him from that. So he's defending Joshua, the high priest. And he says, now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes. I mean, this is the high priest, Right? But he's dressed in filthy clothes as he, the stood before the angel. Then the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. 
Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and I will put fine garments on you. I'm going to tell you that you don't have to be afraid of your filthy clothes. Do not be afraid when you're dirty, you're close. We have someone who's willing to wash us at any time. He's someone who's willing to dress us at any time in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God knows our filthiness, our failures, our disappointment, our bad decision, and yet he chose you. So no matter what the accuser comes to you, he has no saying, he has no voice in your life unless you permit it. So when the devil comes to accuse you, remind him that your sin was already paid. Remind Satan that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, our defender. And now, because of Jesus, you and I are seated in heavenly places. And we cannot underestimate the grace of God. The grace of God hasn't been given so we can continue sinning. You know, the grace of God is when we can't. The mercy of God, they're new every day. Do you understand that every morning when we wake up, the first thing is kachin. All of our benefits, you have new mercy for today. So it never runs out. Do you understand? It never runs out. At any point, we can get it right with God because every day, his mercies are new. It never runs out because every day, he continues to love us unconditionally no matter what we've done. Even if we have abandoned him because he never abandoned us. We abandon him. We hide from him. He never hides from us. So when you say, I haven't heard from heaven, no, you don't want to hear what he has to tell you. And that's the reality. I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, two years ago, God spoke to me. You know, when you, you know, I, I think it was after the fast, and I was like, oh, Lord, you know, when you're fasting, you feel like you even have wings, right? And it's not a Red Bull, but you feel like, you know, you have wings, and you can... You even feel a halo because you feel so connected with God because we were created for that. We were created for fellowship. We were created for connection. We were created to, to dwell among one another. We were created to need one another. But you know that devil comes to do, the, uh, the devil comes to separate us even in the church. Do you know the number one thing that is taking Christians out of, out of the body of Christ is loneliness? Do you know that? Loneliness, you're surrounded by people, but yet you're alone. And you're not alone, it's a perception, it's an emotion. And the enemy would tell you, no, you're, you're, so, you're, you're, you're so awkward, you're, you know, you, you don't fit. Oh, no, brother, I fit. Oh, no, he's not my brother, he's my enemy, I'm sorry. No, I fit. Because God had made me, Jesus made me fit for the kingdom. But I was having one of those moments with God and I was crying out and I, and I, and I know when God speaks to me. And I was waiting for something like, you know, you, you're waiting for like, I, was, I know when God speaks to me. And I know what he means. And so I wanted to hear him say, you know, my girl, you're, this year you're going to have no problem. This year everybody's going to just come and encourage you every day. This year you're just going to enjoy life, no problems, nothing. You can eat whatever you want. Sleep whenever you want. I, I wanted something, you know, something like that, right? It doesn't exist. But, and he, and he gave me a word. And he said to me, Virginia, you are the key. And I was like, oh, no. Uh, and I'm being honest. I'm in, my, I'm in my living room. I'm sitting. And I said, oh, no. And it was loud. Oh, no. Find some other person to be the key. I don't even know what that means, but I don't want to be the key. And I told them, I, I don't want to know. I'm not, I'm not lying to you. I don't want to know. I don't want to. And I don't want to be a key. You know when you get tired because you're alive, but if you read the Bible, if you read the, every life of every person that did something for the kingdom, they went through hell and back. Right? I told the Lord, oh, I just want to be like a regular citizen, you know? <laughs> just for a year. Give me like a, a citizenship, like, you know? Our citizenship is in heaven, right? So I was like, I don't, I don't want that. Can I just live life and stay home some Sundays if I want to? 
be late like other people. <laughs> if they want to come to church, they come to church, you know. If they want to think about God, they think about God. If they want to pray, they pray. You know, It's very casual, their relationship, right? It's like you're dating God, right? You say, God, can we go back to our dating days? And so, but I wrote it down. You're the key. And I was like, uh uh-uh. Like that, uh-uh. Those were my words. So I'm going to give you a scripture. Matthew 16, 19. It says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What you lock on earth will be locked in heaven. What you unlock on earth will be unlocked in heaven. So I have my keys. And look, even someone gave me a key. And I'm going to tell you for the last two years, every, every prophetic word, wherever I've been, people that I don't even know, they just feel led to tell me that I am the key. And you know when you don't want to be the key, you're like, oh, thank you. You're numb. Thank you, but no thank you. And, you. and you act like you receive it, right? Oh, thank you. Really? God told you I'm the key? Oh, praise Jesus. But inside, I'm like, no. No, no, no. I don't want to be the key. And this Christmas, I even got a key. And I was with Dr. Carlos, and he said, you're the key. Somebody else says, like, every prophetic person that I met from other, you are the key. I was like, me or Alexis? (laughs) Which one? I wanted her, Alexis, or somebody else. Can my husband be the key? I was at a point in my life that I want people to carry me. I want people to love me. I don't want to fight. I just want a break. And you know, not too long ago, the Lord revealed what he meant. And he said, Virginia, you are the key. And then I look at my key. These are nice keys, okay, because I had them made. But my keys, actually, the, my car key and my house key, it's so bended. Like, it's ugly. Ugly. And I, look, and I took up my key, and I was like, really? Look at this key. Well, this one's pretty. But I was like, it's broken. And it has dips. And it has ups, and it has downs. And it has ridges. And the Lord said, and I was, I was just describing the key, and he said, he says, the key is that you're broken in the right places. And sometimes we don't want to be, and we don't want to be broken in the right places. Because it's a process. It's, it's a painful process. But he will never ask us to do anything or go through anything if he's not with us. He will never. He's such a good God that he will never ask you to be a key or to be whatever. He will never ask you to do something without him. And I remember looking at the key and I was, I was weeping. And I was weeping and I said, oh my gosh. You, you appreciate the key. You were made uniquely. Your story is uniquely. Your story is not like anybody's story. It might, we might have things that happen to us that, that relate, oh, that happened to me too. But my story is my story. Your story is your story. And you need to be broken in the right places. Because you we appreciate the key because the key is the answer. The key is an answer. Jesus is the key of our lives. So therefore, we can be the key of other people. My broken places, I can bring transformation to other people because I allow God to break me in some places that I didn't want to be broken. And I can tell them, I know how it feels. You see this little thing that happened here? Oh, I know how that feels. Because my key looks different than your key. And unless you allow God to mold you, to build you, you won't be able to open doors, the, op- the doors that belong to you. And those doors are not only for you, it's those doors so we can open and we can lead other people through those doors. Maybe the doors of loneliness, maybe the doors of depression, maybe the doors of suicidal thoughts, maybe the, the doors of being abused. I don't know what door. But God is asking you, do not be afraid of the pain. 
out of our greatest pain comes out the greatest miracles in life. The greatest anointing. You want to be anointed? Surround your key. Because this was me. I'm going to show you this one. See this key? This is the one I like. Flat line. This open nothing. It looks like a key. It looks like it could open things. But no, I haven't allowed it to be broken so I can open things. Look. You have to have the right key to be able to open the door. Maybe the door of unforgiveness. See, if I don't know how to forget, I can't leave no one. I can't open this. I can't. I haven't allowed God to break me in that place. Okay, I'm going to try another one. Maybe I can, I can help people be transformed by God. But look, it's the key. It won't open it. It won't. Because it's not broken in the right places. I don't know how to forgive. I, I say that I forgive, but I haven't given that part to God. Maybe one of those people that are so lonely and you're trying and you're trying, and, but you don't allow God. He's the only one who can fulfill your void. And of course, the key that doesn't even have nothing won't even go in. And if it goes in, it means nothing. But see, when we have the key and you allow God, and of course this door won't open because we just made it, right? But you get the picture. So if we can do the camera here, but look, this is the key that is broken in the right places. And this is the key that would unlock. So we can enter in. And once I enter in, I can tell you how how I got there. You know, a lot of, we now like messages that are very inspirational. And I love inspiration. But what I'm going to tell you, tell me how you overcame depression. Tell me how you overcame those suicidal thoughts. I want to know how. I tell you how. Allowing God and surrendering those places that no one can fill the void. Only God can restore you. Only God, only Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the key. And he has commanded us. We have a command from heaven. We, he says, you are, my, you are my ambassadors. You represent me. How can I represent him? How can I open doors? How can I lead people into restoration if I don't allow myself to be broken? And I'm closing with this. One of the things as I was reading, and I have read it a million times. And I can say that because it's been 22 years me reading the Bible, right? But I was reading when Jesus went to the cross. And I never saw it like this. I want you to go to Matthew 16, 19. And when I'm having this conversation with God, I thought about him. I, I, I saw him like... I saw him and how much he loves us. I'm going to tell you that he loves you. He is relentless. Relentless to reconcile you to the Father. He's relentless for you to walk in your divine purpose. He is relentless for you to know who you are. If we, for you to know who he is in your life. That he is the great I am. I am your answer. I am your joy. I am your peace. I am your strength. I am. I am your salvation. I am everything that you need. I am. You name it. I am. And I picture God and I, and I was thinking about his, when he went to the cross and sometimes there's, there's parts in us that need to die. And I'm going to tell you that when we're dying to parts that we don't want to give up, we don't want to surrender, it's painful. It's painful. The process is painful, but it's doable because we're not doing it alone. We're doing it with him. We're doing it with Jesus, and God is with us, and we have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us, who has the power. And when I read this, I cry. Matthew 16, 19, and I have read it. So many times, I said, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Did I read that already? Whatever you lock, you would unlock. And whatever you close, you will, 
you know, it, it's up to you. What do you want to open this year? What do you want to open this year? That's not that scripture that I want to read. But what do, I, what do you want to open this year? What, what, what do you need to lock? Whatever you permit is permitted. Whatever you, you uh, forbid is forbidden. That's how powerful the authority that Jesus has given to us. But this is the scripture that I actually wanted to read. Mark 15, 23. And this is Jesus when he died on the cross and in the Amplified. They said they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh to dull the pain. But he would not take it. This is in the Amplified. And I, and I did my study and I thought... Before the other one says that he, he asked, he was thirsty. You can read it. You can read, we, we, you can read all Mark. And it says he was thirsty and he asked. And this was kind of an aesthetic that they would do for people that were dying. So when he said that he was thirsty, they, they gave him, they offer him. They offer him wine mixed with mirth because it's an anesthetic. It, it dulls the pain just a little bit. And when he knew that it was that, he refused. He said he refused to take it. I tell you why. Because he wanted to take every bit of the pain for you and I. He was willing to go and to die a painful death. A painful death. And I'm like, you refuse. You refuse to dull your pain. And I'm going to tell you, we as Christians, we love to dull our pain. We love it. And you say, no, I do not. I love the process. No. You know how we dull the pain? Many times we dull the pain being in social media. I don't want to think about my problems. I don't want to think about what I need to go do. I don't want to think about this situation. So what, what am I going to do? I'm just going to live on social media. And you can spend hours being numb. You numb your pain with, with addictions. You numb your pain with pornography. You numb your pain with, let, let's talk about it. We numb our pain with alcohol. We numb our pain with, with drugs. We numb our pain with being busy. We numb our pain being workaholics. We numb our pain shopping. We, we, we numb our pain with food. We, we find something to numb it. I have. I'm on a Netflix binge. I don't get hungry, but I can I can watch TV for like not that TV, but Netflix. I can do a whole twenty four hours because I don't have to think. So what am I doing? I am replacing God, and I replace and I refuse to go through my process, so I will numb it. And I said, you know what? If Jesus, if we're able to do greater things than Jesus, and Jesus refused to numb the pain, who are we to try to numb it? Who are we to know? No, I don't want to go through the process. It's too hard. And then I thought whenever, every time I have felt alone, I have felt lonely in my life. Yes, as a Christian, as a pastor. And I said, I don't have to feel like that because he felt it for us. He said in Mark, if you, if you read before, he says, he said, God, why have you forsaken me? He understood loneliness. He was, he was God himself, but he came in a physical body. He felt everything, every emotion. He felt lonely, literally lonely because God had forsaken him. This was his, this was the thing. He needed to go and he needed to die. He needed to take every pain, every sorrow, every sickness, everything. He had you in mind on that cross. And that's so hard to grasp. What? You have me in mind. You thought about me. I wasn't even born. That was 2,000 years ago, Lord. He said, no, I had you in mind. And I refuse to numb my pain. So you don't have to numb it. So you don't have to carry it. So you don't have to be sick. So you don't have to be bound. I'm going to tell you that we serve an amazing God. And I'm going to ask you not to be afraid of whatever process God is walking through you. He's walking with you. And he will hold your hand. He will lead you. You might cry, but friend, you are not alone. And I'm sure that in those three days that Jesus was dead, oh, hell was having a party. 
And maybe hell has been having a party because you look like you're dead. You're flatlining. You're living, but you're just existing. You're not even living. And hell is like, yeah, I have her. I have him. Well, my friend, it's time for you to resurrect. Because he died for you. He died for you and I. And we can arise. We can actually declare life when we're feeling like we're dying. We can actually speak words of life over our own self. We can actually prophesy. We can actually start speaking everything against what I feel. And doing things that I don't feel like doing it. You know what I told the Lord? Make me the key then. I cry and so be it. Then you call me to be a key? Oh, it took me two years but I, here I am. Here I am. You will never ask me to be a key. If you were not with me. He will never ask you that. So I know that all of you here are key sitting just to be molded. There's only people that I can reach, but there's people that you can reach with your story. And you can say, God is that good. God is that good. God is so good. And you know when you feel lonely, do not allow loneliness to lie to you. I was doing a study. Number one, loneliness is what's making people commit suicide. Do you understand? And it's taking our youth. And it's taking, they said the study says that it takes our youth. Ages between now, it's even worse. Ages between 7 and 16. Number one. And it's taking our men. Isn't it something? It says men between 40 and 55. Youth, they're our future. Men need to take their place in this time. But the enemy will lie to you. You fail. There's no way you can recover. Oh, you can recover, my friend, and then some. Because God is with us. So you have the key, right? Everybody got a key? Go get a chain, put it around. Go mold it. And remind yourself that you need to be broken in the right places. To be able to be effective in the kingdom of God. And do not dull your pain. Because Jesus already took it upon himself on that cross. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.